Welcome back to the Donahue Group. We're feisty and ready to go here on this episode <laughs> yeah. and talking about Warmed state up. issues. Joining me, former state Senator Cal Potter, Professor Tom Paneski, mathematics professor at UW Sheboygan, Ken Risto, the fun part of the equation, the truth teller, as he is telling us, um, a social studies teacher in the Sheboygan no, Area School District. Tom said that off camera. Yeah. I didn't say that. All right, very good. I'm, I'm just a simple social studies teacher, teacher trying to get by. There you go. And I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, just a simple country lawyer. So. Trying to get by. Trying, trying to, to get, get by. by. Just a little help from your friends. <laughs> I'm sitting on top of the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. become Buddha. <laughs> Well, and we're full of wisdom and, and all sorts of insights uh, uh, today, uh, talking about lots of stuff going on uh, at the state level. And um, we had alluded to um, just getting back to the big race in April of 2007 in, uh, on a state base of, basis, of course, is the uh, Supreme Court justice race. Um, there will be a woman. Uh, it'll either be Annette Ziegler or Attorney Linda Clifford from uh, Madison. Um, Judge Ziegler is from Washington County. She was appointed by Tommy Thompson in the mid-90s, I believe. Linda Clifford is a longtime lawyer um, with um, a Madison law firm and uh, well-respected uh, as an attorney. Um, uh, as we talked about in our, in our local show, um, uh, Linda Clifford got schwetzed, uh, severely beaten uh, in Sheboygan County, capturing only about 16, 17% of the vote. Um, Annette Ziegler did very well. Uh, Judge Ziegler also did extremely well statewide. Um, this promises to be an incredibly expensive election. Um, both Clifford and Ziegler have raised about the same amounts of money, but the special interests, as they call them, the independent expenditure, the independent expenditure groups have been out in force for uh, Judge Ziegler. I know people in Sheboygan who got five robo calls, as they're mm -hmm. called, yep. um, automatic phone calls from uh, the Chamber of Commerce and a, a variety of other organizations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we got one Linda Clifford one uh, from uh, Senator Feingold, so it's I just think robocalls are terrible. I don't care who's calling. I find it extremely irritating to have a recorded voice on the other end of the line. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but it must work because they're putting a lot of money into it. Well, there was it. a lot of media also, radio and even TV. I don't know about TV, but certainly radio. I mean, every time I had the radio on, it seemed like the Ziegler had a little message that was, uh, you know, yeah. about the Supreme Court. <clears throat> And I didn't. I actually didn't know who the other two candidates were. I just knew that Ziegler was a candidate. That's exactly wow. right. That was my <laughs> wow. same experience too. I got wow. a call. I didn't get. A, I got a call from Ziegler, uh, or whomever, you know, on the end of the telephone. And it seemed like on the radio when I was listening to commercial radio, Ziegler was the only name I was hearing. And so, if you're the average voter walking in the booth, I would think that's about the only name you might be familiar with. Yeah, because you've um, heard it so many times. And it was she was supported by the majority of police and. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the ad and, and sheriffs and uh, departments well, around the state, okay. DAs. If you'll remember that the attorney general's race in the end ended up costing $3.3 million with um, uh, independent expenditures and so forth, the potential for the cost of this race is really um, incredibly high. And the concern that I have is that at least we perceive that our justice system is not for sale by special interest groups, and yet, in order to run a competitive statewide race, who's going to do it? Right. It's somebody who is either independently wealthy or who has the ties, because of ideological um, orientation, to special interest groups that have a whole lot of money. And I'm talking on both sides of the aisle here. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there has been talk for a long time that has gone absolutely nowhere about true public financing for Supreme Court justice races and from my perspective as I watch this sorry spectacle of endorsements and um, I frankly want a judge who's pretty independent and whose every vote I do not know in advance mm -hmm. of the election some a judge who will come to it what's the current situation we have seven justices seven justices and a conservative a conservative 
is retired, is that it? Uh, John Wilcox is retiring, who is not a trial court judge. Judge Ziegler is making a lot out of the fact that she was a trial court, that she is a trial so court judge. Is, and is the court kind of split on that? Right. Very much. So like this three, is being three? perceived, yeah, this is being perceived as this the person will be the swing, swing vote, vote on right. a variety of issues. On a variety of issues. And that's why everybody's, you know, saddling up and writing checks. Okay. And it's interesting because okay. no matter what, we'll have four women and three men. Um, yeah. No matter what the, uh, yeah. and, and it was that way for a while before Judge Sykes went to, uh, Justice Sykes went to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. But yeah. win, lose, or draw, and depending on just how ugly this campaign gets, and it got real ugly real quick out of the box, um, there should be public financing. Let me make the pitch at least for Supreme Court justices. I mean, it, they call it independent expenditures, but you know the fancy name at the bottom of the screen is the Chamber of Commerce or maybe a labor organization or whatever it would be. And the candidate knows that. Yep. And yep. I wouldn't want to walk into a courtroom knowing that that person got several hundred thousand dollars in their campaign from a group that I might be in litigation with or something. You know, it just takes the objectivity right from it. Yeah. It used to be the court. Supreme Court uh, election was the last vestige of using public financing. Legislators abandoned it early on, and so did the governor's office because they couldn't. The spending limits were so low, but the courts historically never spent that much, and as a result, they did use public financing. But it's only been the last couple races now that it's just changed, and it's it's getting to be uh, most of the ads, as you can see by the disclaimer, are not yeah. coming from the candidate themselves. But and I, I don't think that's a good thing. Yeah, it, it's yes and no. Uh, it, the the public gets to. Uh, tell the rest of the public who they want to support because they want to express their ide ideology. In Congress or in the state legislature, when you give contributions to candidates, you then hope to have their ear on legislation. You go meet with them, you lobby with them, you call them. You don't do that to judges. You don't call a judge, I don't think you call a judge, mm -hmm. and say, oh, you know, this is coming up, I need yeah. your support on this. That well, you, doesn't happen. That's, that's kind crossing of, the ethical yeah. line. Well, you kind of front load the system, though, because you know that, you've, you, that you have a judge who has been supported by all of these groups, and so you infer that if you bring an environmental challenge to a law, that the, 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 the judge would rule this way or would rule that yeah, way. Yeah, but it's by inference. You don't get the, you don't get the lobby them like well, you do if you buy influence yeah, with right. a, a legislative kind of yeah. race. It's well, a pretty straight line drawing, though, I, I, I think. But what we really need, more than anything, from my perspective on the court, liberal or conservative, are people who are smart and who are hardworking and who have good legal minds. Right. And, and the, our Supreme Court has some fine legal minds on it. And I, and I know nothing about Judge Ziegler from, I, I, the Journal Sentinel likes her as a trial judge, that she gets high marks as a trial judge. I have no way of knowing that one way or the other. Linda Clifford is extremely bright. I, you know, I've watched her work and, and I would believe that. But leave the ideology out of it. And the one way to do that is, from my perspective, is not make the appearance that the election is for sale, that the chair is for sale. Well, that's my concern too, is that even if a judge arrives independently after a well-reasoned walk through the case and writes an opinion or the court writes an opinion, now the premise is always going to be, well, well let's follow the campaign money, and, and now the legitimacy of the justice system is really called into question. It, it could very well be that the, the judges, once they get behind those closed doors, will you know, not pay any attention to where the money came from. And that's it's true. A ten, it's a tenure and term, true. and yeah. You, yeah. you figure, you know, whatever. But now you're going to have, the, at least, again, the appearance of, and in the age that we live in, which is the age of cynicism, it's going to be, it's really going to be very difficult for the court to continue to try to impress the public with the legitimacy of its decisions, which is the heart and soul of the system. Well, there's you also know. another aspect to this uh, sort of revisionist thinking about campaigns, and that's uh, the right to life uh, lawsuit that was before yeah. Judge Shabazz, where they sued based on the rule that's in effect, where judges were not supposed to tell how they would rule in a case. Oh. And the right yep. to life says they should be able to tell you how they would rule. Well, God, I would not want to judge uh, previously coming out and saying, well, this, if this case came before me, this is how oh, I, I would rule. rule. Yeah. I mean, when objectivity is, is 
is protected there. I don't see where that is. Well, I don't know if that's being appealed or not. I know Judge yeah. Shabazz about three weeks ago ruled, uh, upheld the rule, but I don't know if it's being appealed or not. Well, the, and, and in other permutations, the uh, Minnesota rule that was quite similar to that, which really prohibited judges from talking about their feelings on various issues, was ruled to be uh, a violation of the First Amendment. And so what you oh, really need, yeah. what you really need are judges who will say, I'm not going to tell you how I'm going exactly. to vote on something because I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to look at the facts before me and the law yeah. as it exists at the time before me, and that's how I'm going to make a decision. And if you want a decision from me now, you need to vote for somebody else. But in, these, yeah. in this day and age, I don't know if that kind of purity of response gets you elected. Now, can I ask another question related? Do all states have elected Supreme Court judges? No. Uh, no. Some no. are appointed by the governor? Right. Or very, by the legislature. Very political. Actually, this is the least political because there's no appointed mechanism. The people get to vote. Well, it depends. You know, the, the federal bench, of course, is, is a lifetime appointment, which should really uh, remove all pressure on how you're going to vote, yeah. that you should feel completely independent. And yet, there's now um, certain judges are being, federal judges are being targeted by certain groups for not being tough enough on sentencing, for example. Oh, no, but I'm thinking and, of state, the various state Supreme sure. Courts. Yeah. But I mean, it's the, it's the same. It is a, it's a wide range of different, and yeah. sometimes the legislature appoints, sometimes the governor appoints, sometimes it's elections. It, it really varies from state to state. But, and there are pluses and minuses to an election versus an appointed system. Hmm. Yeah, the appointed but, system, you don't have to spend all these millions of dollars for a race. Oh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how well, it... The key thing is the length of the term. That's really what insulates you. I mean, that... Yeah. You know, yeah. It, that in reality, that's why the framers had lifetime appointments. They were just absolutely adamant after their experience with the king's judges who served oh. at his pleasure, uh, or her pleasure, I mean, the correct, uh, that they, did, they wanted an independent judiciary. We don't do that in Wisconsin. Ten years is plenty long, uh, to be sure. And uh, so that's what gives them the independence. And, and uh, so I, I know this is, I, Marilyn's absolutely right here. Uh, I, this is going to be just one ugly, very demeaning race for both, for both candidates. And at the end, whoever puts the black robe on and sits in that chair is going to be certainly not somebody we necessarily want to admire. Yeah. Kind of yeah. having to brush, brush, brush things off. Brush the stuff off, off your role. Yeah. Yep. Well, let's move on. Um, just to, to segue off of that. Um, uh, just today, uh, Ziegler got um, uh, Governor Thompson's endorsement. Um, Attorney Clifford has endorsements from um, former Governors Dreyfus and Lucy. So she's uh, so that's kind of getting balanced out a little bit, I guess. <laughs> getting uh, Governor sure. McCallum's yeah. uh, endorsement mm. may not be uh, all that valuable at this point, <laughs> but um, well, you talk about purism, and I guess I'm even purer in this topic, very few times I can say that in the show. But, you know, I'm not sure why Russ Feingold's inject injecting himself in this process it's as a federal win. judge. It's I understand that, win. but I, I really don't like elected officials and, and separations of powers to be, yeah. what do I, you know, I guess, you know, what do I care what Russ Feingold feels or, you know, Tom, you know Dreyfus or whomever. Um, I guess it, it gives voters cues as to where they might be politically coming from, but we're back to portraying judges as no different than, um, and they may not be any different, I suppose, in the final analysis, but we, there's something about courts and why they wear black robes and have certain types of rituals is to give at least the public the impression that they're different than other elected officials. And to, to again, have them seeking out and getting endorsements, make them, make, it makes them look cheap. Yeah. Well, I wanted to so. use that to segue into um, uh, former Governor Thompson's um, presidential race, and um, he's he is working <laughs> at it. He is oh, he is no, working Tommy, at no, it. Well, good luck, Tommy. Oh, I'm, no. sorry. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. Are you he gets, kidding? He gets back on the national stage for a while. Mm -hmm. which is, okay. Yeah. Al Sharpton got the national stage for a while. Now, are you an I'm analogizing? Not oh. <laughs> I'm not comparing Thomas to Sharpton, but. You know, you know, they're not going anywhere, but he gets a forum. Well, <laughs> well, does he get a lot? You know, he gets some campaign money they can later spend for something else. Well, Tommy says yeah, he has I to mean, raise two point five million dollars to be competitive in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Two point yeah. five million dollars for Iowa, yeah. but he is holding out, uh, according to the uh, Journal Sentinel, 
um, high hopes that he will uh, perform well in the Republican straw poll that's set for August 11th in, in Iowa. And um, so it's, it's interesting, just today, former Governor Vilsack, former governor, or is he current governor, Vilsack, dropped out of former. the presidential race. And, um, yep. um, and all sorts of interesting, um, interesting stuff you know, going on with the presidential race. Maybe we'll have to explan ex expand our area of inquiry just as the... Um, but it's so early, isn't it? It's, yes. It's wildly oh, early. So but that early. leads me to another topic, which I think is, is interesting, which is the placement of the Wisconsin primary. The presidential primary will be held in February of 2008. It used to be the very definition of irrelevant. By moving it up into February, um, it has become certainly more relevant. Uh, oh. But it depends mm. on um, yeah. right now on, on where it's placed. We might there's some early Super Tuesday, uh, Super Tuesday primary I think in early February. The Wisconsin primary I think is February 19th in that area, and then you have the traditional March early March uh, Super Tuesday primary. Um, so. I think it's a great idea that Wisconsin could be a player. Um, you can vote however you want to vote. You don't have to vote a party line. Our media, I think, is a little less expensive maybe than California or New York and um, um, kind of play In, to the that, local that, issues. That, that, uh, non, that we don't have to vote a party line where other states have to vote a party line right. makes us, gives us a kind of a cross-section of what the country might be doing and make, yeah, makes Wisconsin a player because we can do that. And what is happening is that, for example, the Republican primary is usually the evangelical right has been sort of anointing the winner in the Republican Party. And they can do that in many states that have caucus systems and so on. But when you get into an open primary, as Wisconsin has, <coughs> in many cases that gives a Giuliani and mm -hmm. others, even a Tommy Thompson for that matter, sure. if he does yeah. well in Iowa and Wisconsin, yeah. Yeah. it gives them a visibility that they wouldn't have if it just were purely a caucus system or some other type of party system yeah. uh, in other states. So, yeah, I think for a number of reasons we could play a more important role. And I'd like to see more states go into that because uh, I'm, it's... When you see what's happened to the Republican Party, and it's not, a, uh, I'm not here to bash Republicans, as although, although I do that sometimes, um, <laughs> you see a lot of people like McCain and others, you know, running way to the right when you know they're not that far right, but they're doing it because they know that sure. they have to get through the primary. If you could set up a system where it really would reflect the national uh, view yeah. and, and really who could be winnable, mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't have these candidates pandering to, to, to the extremes that I think is now happening. I mean, I think there was a lot of um, astonishment that George Bush could have won the nomination as opposed to John McCain, but it was clearly that primary system mm -hmm. that Bush had really worked, and it may be the reason that Hillary Clinton it's the Democratic nomination because the, the system is work, the party lines are, the party connections mm -hmm. are made, right. and you know you have the whole infrastructure, and so no matter what the popular feeling might be is, is that candidates get catapulted that way. And um, who was talking $1 trillion? I was. Okay, tell us what that was. Well, I was you know, listening to uh, NPR, and they were talking to a Democratic fundraiser the other, last night as I was driving home, and they were talking about California moving their primary, which was really become irrelevant, which was in June. I, I'm not quite to sure. February. February. Early February. Really front loading it. Mm -hmm. And um, they were saying it was a staggering thing. They said that, he said, if he was accurate, that when you look at all the money raised nationally for presidential elections, um, Californians contribute something like. 30% or some huge amount, wow. uh, and, and you know they give all this money, but they have very little say as to who the actual nominees mm -hmm. are in the end of the process. Um, so they wanted to keep some of the California dollars in at home for influence. Um, <laughs> but, but, he, but he was saying, but he was saying that, that given all the candidates and how it might be very, fairly competitive, by the time we get done before the general election, just the primary cycle of this election cycle, one trillion dollars will probably wow. be spent on uh, campaigning. One trillion dollars in the primary, right? You know, and I and everybody, this is kind of interesting. I so I kind of liken it to standing, you know, sitting in a basketball game, and one person stands up, and and they get a better view than everybody. Everybody's rushing forward, 
I, I think nobody's really on the, on the party level really thought about um, what the effect of that's going to be. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to have all of the primary thing, season clustered um, into these early months. And I don't know at what point you finally say, well, we're not going to do these things in the even numbers, and you all end up in the odd numbers. Right. You know? I mean, why not move it up why? to now? I mean, yeah. it's just, I mean, it really but is see, the, But the effect of that's going to be, I think, is you're going to have it so compact that, first of all, we don't have a real staggering vetting process. And secondly, it's going to really play into candidates who can raise huge amounts of money fairly quickly. Jimmy, a guy like Jimmy Carter would never get elected yeah. in this new cycle. Carter kind of came out They'll of the do caucuses. Me media rather than yeah, the he kind of did. State you know, visits. right. Yeah. He went to New Hampshire, did that kind of retail politics, met mm -hmm. people, created yeah. some buzz, went to Iowa. I don't know if the Iowa caucuses were actually in play in '76, but he, did, he had a small venue, and then media paid attention to him, and then some money came in. A, a, a candidate like that, even Bill Clinton, wouldn't get nominated. You know, maybe good news or bad news, depending on your perspective. But Clinton, you know, t took a pounding in New Hampshire, but was able to, or actually took a yeah, took a pounding, able to make his case to a small audience, a small media. If you took a scandal like Jennifer Flowers in a California market, you wouldn't have the money or the time to to respond to that one way or the other. Well, I think it's going to have a real profound effect, and it's yeah. going to make money more important and media more important, and say what you want about the non-representation of New Hampshire and Iowa and some of these earlier primaries, but at least the candidates have to meet people face to face, yeah, yeah. make their case, and those folks, for whatever their lack of representation, take it seriously. They really watch those candidates and look and pay attention. Now it's going to be what you see on TV, yeah. and I just don't think it's going to be good for the process. Yeah. Well, interesting enough, and we'll see what role Wisconsin end up, ends up playing. Um, Governor Doyle's uh, State of the State address had something for everybody. Um, it was really... Imagine uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> it was fairly remarkable, um, particularly the um, representative who stood up to applaud um, the governor's uh, uh, mention of uh, oil profits as really the way to go. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you like those guys that are just kind of out there. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was great. Um, one of the things in our the Wisconsin Academy group that uh, that all of us here belong to um, uh, gathered uh, uh, last week and talked about health care um, and health insurance uh, provisions uh, that are in the budget. The governor's health care task force came up with a, a plan. There are other plans out there. Um, what is amazing to me is that um, not amazing, but as one of our speakers pointed out, has it happened in Wisconsin finally that there is what he called the tipping point? In other words, that businesses before, five years ago, who might have yelled socialized medicine, oh, this is the worst thing in the world, now there are four or five actually fairly well thought out, um, thoughtful health insurance universal yeah. coverage plans out there, some that may cost more or may cost less or whatever. But have we, have we reached the tipping point where employers say, well, we just can't do this anymore. We cannot handle this anymore. Um, I, I'm curious, I don't know what the, what the legislature is going to do with any or all of the proposals, but to me they're pretty, they didn't get very far in the mm -hmm. Republican legislature, but I'm thinking these days it might, uh, might be a little different. Well, I think you, once you start uh, taking the old coalition that was against it, which included, you know, the business community, the insurance community, the old state uh, mm -hmm. moneyed uh, benefactors from the system, um, now that you've got that division, I think people are starting to look at the fact that in the nation, 46 million people without any health insurance, um, insurance companies taking 30, 40 percent of the of the money that's spent on health care and, and looking at what the cost of it is, everybody's looking at this and saying, you know, our businesses are at a competitive disadvantage to other industrialized countries, you know, people aren't covered. Um, all these things are piling up and I think your, your analogy of a tipping point is probably that all of these groups are saying, yeah, the things aren't all rosy in the garden here, let's start looking at solving this problem and I think people are now open you know, when Hillary first led the charge, everybody dumped on her and she was out the door in six months uh, with no hope. I think uh, that's not going to happen this time. The, the problems are of great enough magnitude and there's a coalition of people talking 
that I think there could, there's real hope, may take two years, three years, but it, I think there's real hope for some change. And I think there's a recognition on the federal level, at least, that both Medicare and medical assistance are very efficiently run. I, the numbers we heard is that their overhead costs are, or their administrative costs are about 4%, right. whereas private insurance companies run anywhere from 20 to 40%. And so this is, contrary to what Rush Limbaugh might say, that there are some areas where the federal government has uh, run. Do you listen to Rush? <laughs> <laughs> I, this is, how did you this know? is all I know from oh, Al okay. Franken. <laughs> this okay. is what Al Franken says, Rush oh, Limbaugh oh, says. Okay. So I could be wrong. wrong. <laughs> that might be a misrepresentation. But uh, well, Al Franken said it was probably more articulate. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's running for the Senate. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah well, so. or, or, or is but, he, yeah, he, yeah, he yeah, seems I, to have lost his sense of humor, which is really, really too mm -hmm. bad. But Take us off point, sorry. Um, but I think you're right. I think businesses, when businesses finally say, we've got to find some kind yeah. of a solution. I don't know if the road takes you to a single uh, play, a payer system. Yeah, uh, I don't know. System. No. I, don't think the, I don't think Americans are quite ready for that yet. But, um, but at least there's some plans that are, are, are being out there and they're being discussed seriously. And I think everybody recognizes that it's going to have to happen on the state level because uh, it's not going to happen at least in the next couple of years and the national level yet. Yeah. And I think the bucks are talking. I mean, even yeah. there's plans coming from the AFL-CIO and so on, models sort of as per workers' comp, where the cost per employee, I think they're talking, you know, four or six hundred dollars, while family plans oh. that business are paying are eleven, twelve hundred dollars. Yeah. I mean, eventually you get to a point where you say, hey, I'm going to listen to you. You're, you're less than half of what I'm paying. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly right. And of course, there continue to be quality issues in American health care and uh, um, so it's complex. We just have a couple of minutes left, but I did want to, I think that we should, as a group, spend a little time congratulating both the Assembly and the Senate for having passed, at long last, the ethics reform bill, which was in front of it. The Assembly uh, passed 97 to 2. Uh, the Senate passed unanimously the bill which uh, abolishes both the um, State Elections Board and the State Ethics Board, combines them in one organization that has um, True investigation power, hopefully nonpartisan, um, even-handed uh, investigation power. Um, I, um, I think it's a good start. Now we need to do something about the thing that gets politicians in trouble, so they don't have to come before this new body <laughs> with their with their yeah. baggage and their law-breaking activities. Yeah. We need campaign finance reform. Yeah, true true stuff that's, yeah. that, that is out there and, and that really works. Otherwise, you're is, going to take these judges and they're going to be, they're going to look at a lot of this stuff and say, this is almost like a sandbox type situation. You know, he said, she said, they did this. And, and then there's a, it, maybe the system uh, structure that has now been put in place just won't work as well until we fix the other part of it. Yeah. So. When something passes 97 to 2, is it meaningful at all? I mean, I hate again to be the cynic here. Yeah. I was just... It's probably a combination. Age, it was watered down, and, and yeah, secondly, I mean, I haven't had a chance to see the conversation back and forth. I know we know the Democrats in the national level were congratulating themselves to the point of breaking their you know, their arm on ethics reform, and there are such big loopholes in that mm -hmm. law that it's not going to change dramatically yeah. anything, in my view. So when I see something passed that overwhelmingly, <laughs> it seems to me that we're looking at symbolism than you than substance. You are cynical. You really are. Well, we'll see how it goes, and I think there will continue to be um, <laughs> efforts to bring forth, you know, what we call real campaign finance reform. I'm not real sure what that is precisely, and I think it means different things to different mm -hmm. people. But as as time goes on, and um, um, and the elections board is a, a thing of the past. So, on that happy note, thank you. Thank you.